Good evening and welcome to Hidden Histories, Urban 15's online cultural magazine. And tonight for our segment, we're going to be talking about poetry in San Antonio through the years. We have a great uh, day. It was Mega Corazon, so we had 18 poets that were reciting through the internet system to schools throughout the country. Uh, we had one school called in from Maine, uh, and that, that was pretty amazing. They just loved They hadn't seen anything like this before, the kinds of poetry coming out of San Antonio. So I want to uh, let you know that this is also National Poetry Month. And one of the things about National Poetry Month is that this is an actual full recognition by the federal government because of the NEA and because of individual po poets who went out there and prodded the NEA to develop a national recognition of what I consume, consider, you know, the, the national pastime. Uh, you know, kids usually learn to rhyme before they throw a football. And uh, it's really uh, critical to us that language be uh, held in such respect that we, we respect each other. And one thing poetry does bring us is the consciousness that the written word and the spoken word can be used to make friendship. It can be used to hurt people. But in poetry, I mean, I've never heard a hurtful poem, really. The most mm. hurtful thing is <laughs> I've ever heard has been among poets. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so tonight um, we have a... Uh, Special recognition and the fact that the man who brought National Poetry Month to San Antonio, Jim Levia de Haviland, is here with us tonight. Uh, he brought it in 1985 or 95, or uh, right. uh, the consciousness that San Antonio should participate in this in this event. And he started with maybe four or five of us in the along the river there uh, near the Southwest Craft Center, that was as it was called. And we doing percussion improvisation with poems, uh, tearing up poems, and people reading different lines from it, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so Jim is here tonight, and we have Carmen Tafoya, who uh, who is a major influence on the whole Chicano poetry movement. She is a scholar, uh, a PhD, doctor at the University of Texas San Antonio. She was a San Antonio poet laureate, as I say, lariat, and uh, many a time. And she is here tonight, uh, giving us some insight into poetry in San Antonio. And then we have Bryce Milligan, who is probably one of the most influential publishers and poets in the community right now, because there are very few presses as powerful and accessible as Wings Press. And uh, Jim is bringing us everything. Uh, uh, Bryce is bringing us everything from, sorry about that, uh, from science fiction, experimental writing, to poetry, to vintage poetry, to archives. Uh, his press is very influential here in the community. <laughs> so I've said enough. Let's, you know, they say what, talking about poetry is like singing about football or something <laughs> like that. But, but I'll. Bryce, you, 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 you lead us on today. Well, it was my privilege to edit this new anthology called Literary San Antonio. It came out from TCU Press a couple of months ago. And in writing uh, the introduction, I had to do a lot of research into the history of uh, writing done here. And it occurred to me uh, that San Antonio has really been shaped by the written word over the course of three centuries. The first written reports by the Spanish explorers, the fathers, the padres, and the soldiers alike went back to Spain and they brought immediately more people. The Mexican reports brought more Mexicans. American reports certainly brought 
tons of American settlers. And um, it was a PR game in many ways. Uh, so the opinion of San Antonio, San Antonio's self-opinion was formed by the written word and uh, the opinion of the world of San Antonio was formed by the written word and, and really the city was shaped that way. But one of the, the, the last poem we heard uh, by Carmen was this river here. And the first thing that was written about was the river. So this is uh, something from um, 1691 by Father Damien Massanet. It says, on this day there were so many buffaloes that the horses stampeded and 40 head ran away. We found at this place the rancheria of the Indians of the Payaya Nation. It was a very large nation in the country they live in is very fine. I call this place San Antonio de Padua because it was his day. In the language of the Indians, it's Yana, called Yanaguana. The Yanaguana is, of course, the name for the river as well. Um, another description from 1709, just a few years later, talking about the beauty of the area and, and the springs. We crossed a large plain in the same direction, and after going through a mesquite flat and some home groves, we came to an irrigation ditch bordered by many trees and with water enough to supply an entire town. It was full of taps and sluices and springs. The earth was terraced. We named it San Pedro Springs, and at a short distance we came to a luxuriant growth of trees, high walnuts, poplars, and elms, watered by a copious spring, which rises near a populous rancheria of Indians. The springs were described as being shooting eight to 10 feet in the air, and the river was described as navigable from the source. So hmm. it's a very different reality than what we have now. But this river here is, <laughs> it's been a defining force all these years. I think that one of the things that we have to give some credence to is that when writers have written about San Antonio, it's not just the English speaking world that's paid attention. For a long while, if you said San Antonio in the US, People talked about the Alamo. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, remember that? It all happened in, what was it, 1835, 1836? And so the history of San Antonio was told, it was publicized a lot in the English speaking uh, newspapers, journals, novels, um, got a lot of beautiful attention. Um, but that's being a little bit Anglo-centric. That's only looking at the English speaking population. When for 300 years before that, there were Spanish speakers coming through here also describing this area. And yet if we just stick with the Spanish and English, we're being Eurocentric <laughs> because the city and the telling of the beauty of this city in verbal form had been going on for thousands of years as the indigenous peoples told the tales of the, this incredible heroine Yanawana who went to find water for her people and who dies in her search for water but is reborn as a water bird and in the flight above the earth drops drops of water which create the growth of the population of this area that's a metaphor for a life-giving river a life-giving source and that metaphor that tale that legend had been told in an oral literature in this area for thousands of years so what? i believe that 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 gives us an incredible heritage a long varied heritage literarily both in oral literature and later in the written literature you know the first written literature that qualifies as literature was a novel that was written here in uh, 1838 by a guy named uh, was a Frenchman named A.T. Mirth and here's his description in the novel of a guy that just he was in great danger and they were trying to flee a battle <clears throat> in San Antonio but he had to be a tourist and stop to see the springs before he left town <laughs> <laughs> so he says uh, the captain had heard so much about the large springs which form the San Antonio River that he would by no means pass by without seeing them. And we were obliged to, to indulge him with the sight. So he conducted us, to, or we conducted him to the spot during the night. 
to in, in order to incur less danger of exposure. There a vast body of water gushes out of four large pools of unfathomable depth, as clear as crystal, giving rise to a stream that would be navigable were it not for its rapidity. As our hero was lost in a maze at the beauty of the scene, the quatrain exclaimed, here is a place marked out by nature for one of the great cities in the globe. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, they don't, they don't call them babbling brooks for no reason. <laughs> orality, orality has always been undervalued. I actually think we're making a circle because we're at a point now in this city's life of literature. Certainly we have great books being published by Bryce and books are coming out, but at the same time, the spoken word life of this city, the vibrant. poetry slam life of this city, Amalia Ortiz and Andrea Sanderson vocab, who's reading later tonight, is just breathing another sense of life in. So I think it has come around to right. understand the value of voice and what it does. Very recently, the Texas Institute of Letters decided, um, as they recognized distinguished writers who have made major <laughs> contributions to the work, um, that they would include songwriters in that. So and when you think about- They just elected Willie. <laughs> yes, they just elected Willie Nelson That's great. as a member of the Texas Institute of Letters who bought himself a lifetime of membership immediately. Uh, you know, I mean, paid his dues for a lifetime is the way you do it. You don't buy your way into the institute. But um, that recognition of the power of word even within the context of song, it's not just the music that creates a song. There is, a, there is an art and there is a gift to using words, whether it's in a song, whether it's on stage, whether it's in dichos, whether it's in declaimed poetry, which has a long, long history here in San Antonio. Um, though, we have that. though not in 17 characters <laughs> in the middle of the night from Florida. <laughs> Those are, that doesn't count. Yeah, okay? definitely. Right. And and when we look at, I, I love what Bryce has done with this book, capturing um, both the way that literature has defined San Antonio and the way San Antonio has influenced literature. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quote one of your um, uh, commentaries in here, um, showing that even writers recognize that words aren't capturing it. We're in the process of trying to capture it. Larry McMurphy. McMurtry, famous, famous Larry McMurtry, said that Texas writers, quote, have never really captured San Antonio. Somehow the Spanish have managed to hold it. We have attacked with freeways and motels, shopping centers, and that H-bomb of boosterism hemisphere. But <laughs> happily, the victory still eludes us. San Antonio has kept an ambiance that all the rest of our cities lack. And that's a recognition from somebody who's not a San Antonian. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's not, not any bias in that. So published poetry in San Antonio, do you have a, a background as to when poetry started seeping into printed press as either in the newspapers oh, or yeah. in? Well, it, yeah, tell it, us the, the first printing presses arrived in the 18, early 1820s and we had Spanish language newspapers here almost immediately. Yes. Uh, and they, virtually all of them, published poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite often, though, as soon as the Anglo papers began cranking out uh, political diatribes, the editors would write extremely bad poetry as uh, political uh, things. And there was one guy named uh, Hugh Kerr, and the one review of his book says, uh, oh, Kerr, Kerr, what'd you write them poems for? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, so, there's yeah. there have been other applications of poetry, as Bryce mentioned. Political. Uh, I think about uh, the famous Henry B. Gonzalez um, when he ran for office the very first time. Ran against um, a man named Good, uh, G O O D E, who would round up all the people of San Antonio and buy them beer and buy them tamales, let them vote, and then drop them back off in their neighborhood, not look at them again until the next year. 
And so Henry B. ran with a very clever little poem that, that had an impact uh, enough to elect Henry B. And it said, drink goods beer and eat goods tamales, but go to the polls and vote for Gonzalez. <laughs> and he won. <laughs> so <laughs> the power of poetry is of poetry. manifested in many different ways. <clears throat> now, of course, political writing in San Antonio. You know, the Plan de San Luis Potosí they draw, you know, that, that created mm -hmm. the Mexican Revolution was not only written here, but published here. At yes. Martinez's yes. print shop. Yeah. And ironically, yes. the building that uh, uh, Madero lived in is the parking lot of Art Pace. Yeah. Yes. Right there. That's <laughs> yes. the, the, on Main Hutch, Street. Is, Hotel. Right. right. The, the, the hotel yeah. is where... My, and I want to I want to talk about uh, something too related to the Chicano movement. A lot of times historians make mistakes when they want to find out about uh, social political revolts. Uh, they look only at legal situations, political elections, protest signs, and they ignore the role that the arts play in developing concientización in a community, an awareness, a fuller awareness of really understanding the whys and the wherefores and, and developing some um, serious involvement in how the, the laws of our community are, are made. Um, in the 1970s, in fact, starting in the late 60s with the beginnings of the Chicano movement here, there were so many artists and writers and poets that helped express what the frustrations were of the people so that other people would join with them and unify. And I can't go through this without mentioning the Johnny Appleseed of the Chicano movement, um, of Chicano publishing, Cecilio Garcia Camarillo, who would go and start up a magazine or a newspaper, and when it was going really well, he would turn it over to somebody and he'd go move to another town and start a magazine there. Um, and so he began in San Antonio. In fact, I brought with me a couple of copies that I have of a magazine, January 1973, magazine, September 1973. Um, these were arts magazines, and they were featuring uh, um, artists and writers, uh, there's a special on Carmen Lomas Garza in here. Um, there uh, are articles that talk about uh, writers. Uh, he went from this to a little newsprint, 25 cent monthly magazine called Caracol, which published, it, it was my first publication. I have several copies. And too, it day. published everybody from Rolando Hinojosa Smith uh, to Max Martinez, to a lot of the significant writers of the Chicano movement. Um, and and, it, and so it's not given it. credit. It's one of those secrets of history that, <clears throat> that it was the arts that brought uh, the awareness of injustice and the protest to a, a, a common, a popular acceptance. Well, I want to thank the three of you for coming to Urban 15 tonight to talk about poetry. Uh, We've had a great day of poetry. Uh, Jim, we don't ever get to hear you recite very often, but you were kind enough two weeks ago to come in, and without a couple of beers, you sat there and did some really great <laughs> presentations. It was, it was pretty early for a couple of beers. I will, <laughs> I will manage a couple of beers quite soon. I, I, in fact, I will match our new poet laureate beer for beer if he right. wants. Oh, I, um, I, I, she'll, she'll win, though, if you get well, all wait, the wait, poet laureate. Oh, 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 I'm not the new one. I'm in. I'm in. You and John against Carmen, and you have no... <laughs> This is the drinking under the table poetry challenge. <laughs> oh, this is this is great. Well, well let's let's we let's jump to that. <laughs> in the, in Bonazzi. The, we jump to uh, your poetry reading, and then we're going to actually have Isa Cardenas come in, who is going to bring us the oral tradition of what San Antonio was oh, long great. before those horses arrived. You know, so that's one of the things tonight. But hidden histories. Uh, we have another one coming up on, I believe it's May 5th, May 4th, and uh, that one is going to be for the Kiwanis Club, uh, bringing in their footage and their Super 8 and VHS of the <laughs> Fiesta Noche del Rio, 
Uh, I didn't realize it was started in 1952, and they've been going all these years. And also on uh, the May issue of Hidden Histories, people send in your pony pictures. We are going to do the (laughs) pony collage of any pictures that you have, that your parents had, of you sitting on that brown and white pinto that was all over the west side and the south side. Uh, And the east side. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Congratulations on all the work that you've done and what you're doing now with the uh, uh, Gemini Inc. It's fascinating and fabulous what you're doing with youth. Carmen, your career grows and grows, and my bookshelf gets smaller and smaller <laughs> with every new publication. <laughs> and Bryce, thank you for the contribution to, to San Antonio. Sure. Hidden Histories. Uh, first Monday of every month uh, through the end of December. God willing, we will have an ep- uh, season two starting next January. So uh, keep those checks and credit cards coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank, Thank you, George. George. I got here in 1995. One of the first people I met was Trinidad Sanchez. And Trino and I, Trino took me to a number of fairly seedy places to uh, read poems and uh, be heckled. And it was, uh, it was, um, it was great fun. And Trino and I did a series of public readings at lunch times in Main Plaza, before it was all, back when it looked somewhat different than now. And in fact, I, I don't know if you knew this, but at Beale House, where we now do many literary events, where Trino was living, there's a, at every literary event of Trino's, uh, every literary event we have, th- we put out Trino's uh, beret, because uh, his spirit is always there. So Trino was my introduction to poetry in San Antonio. Uh, a little bit after that, the main, the, the big Legareta library, the main library opened. And I don't know if you recall, but the the library system ran a series of major readings of the biggies, folks with big names, um, one of whom was Sandra Cisneros. That was at when I first met Sandra. But that was the reading at which Sandra excoriated the San Antonio Public Library and the library system and the library upper echelon for the lack of Latino and Latina uh, writing. She asked for, well, no. (laughs) Sandra never asked. Sandra demanded that the library develop a Latino collection. And now there is. It took a long time. So that was that series of readings. And the other thing that was happening was that Bryce Milligan and Sandra were running the Inter-American Book Fair. And I was, and that was my, both my introduction to the Guadalupe and to Bryce, Sandra, Rosemary Katakalos, um, the whole, it, it and, and Bryce and Sandra did amazing things with that. And because I was the director of the Children's Museum, my own writing life, <laughs> you know this, the, the issue of being a creative person and, and, and having an administrative life as well, my writing life suffered some. Trino didn't let it suffer very often. He would call me and say, we have to go to this place. And then Trino would regularly introduce me. He would say, this guy says he's read in f- over 500 readings around the country. I don't believe him. So uh, I miss Trino pretty much every day. I remember at Angela de Hoyos' uh, wake at the, at the Guadalupe, 
Lucia and I were in the audience, and we are looking at the we're looking up at the stage, and there is the superstars of Chicano literature, the the entire history of Chicano literature in front of us. Um, I will tell you that when I lived in Cleveland and when I lived in Rochester, New York, and when I lived in New York City, with the possible exception of some smatterings of New, New Yorkenos, I really didn't have this literature at my fingertips. So I spent some time listening and learning and hearing and meeting and being absolutely enchanted. I did meet Naomi Nye about the same time as well. So, um, the city is blessed with incredibly fine writers and incredibly fine writers who give back, which is uh, not always the case. So, there is another whole strand of the poetry life of San Antonio that's needing mention here, and that is because I've lived in cities that have had decent poetry scenes, and this town, in addition to decent poetry scenes, had Pecan Grove Press with Palmer Hall, has Wings Press with Bryce Milligan, has Aslan Libre Press with Anisa Onofri and, and Juan Tejeda, um, publication has Voices de la Luna, so has, has enough publication possibilities. I'm in the process of compiling a good list for high school students of places that will take their work as well, because I can say you get immersed in writing a poetry by also hearing it. You get immersed in the life of poetry the first time you're in print. It, 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 it makes a difference. So. A lot is said very often about San Antonio's visual aesthetic and its work in the visual arts and the kind of hybrid voice of the visual arts in San Antonio. Um, not enough, not enough by far, I think, is said about the fact that we have a vibrant and very multi-layered literary life in this city. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to have to have had some great madres of our of our um, literary life in Carmen Tafoya and Naomi Nye and Rose Katakalos and um, Lorianne Guerrero and and Jenny Brown and Wendy Bar I'm Barker, Angela de Hoyos. Earlier than that, we've. And I'm say Madres, even though I know I began with Trinidad Sanchez, but I mean the nurturers, the people who have given life and given their their blood to to the making of literature in San Antonio. Um, and I'll stand by uh, Bryce Milligan and Palmer Hall and Trinidad Sanchez, and and. Numerous. I'm leaving people out, and I feel terrible about it. I have a poem in my Pecan Grove book about about Manny uh, Castillo and San Anto Cultural Arts. Um, another, and Johnny Nahosa and Say C. I mean, the, and many groups like Urban Fifteen and Say C and. Uh, San Anto and Guadalupe, that work in multiple art forms and that are open to literature as well as, as dance, as well as, as uh, cinema, as well as the visual arts. I think we offer that great mix 
and I'm always happy to be here. Well, National Poetry Month in San Antonio began pretty quietly. A couple of events, uh, some work with George. Jesse Castro was working as an artist teacher for me at the Southwest School and working at uh, Saturday Morning Discovery. And Jesse is a very fine poet and a dear, dear friend. And we did an exhibit at the Central Library called Where the Wi Word Things Are, which was about words and pictures and words, um, visual poems in various sorts. Uh, Claire Rhodes Stevenson did a series of panels uh, based on Neruda's objects, um, everyday objects. It was a great show. It was really fun. Um, and then we started to gather up a couple of other pieces of that. Um, the Via Poetry on the Move. One of the questions we had er, right from the beginning was how to, how to disseminate this as widely as we could. How to get poems in the hands of more people. Um, we're still asking that question, but via Poetry on the Move, I had, there were three of us who had poems accepted to the National Poetry in Transit program in Dallas. Asaf Aljundi and I and I think Wendy Barker, but there were three of us. And we sat down and we said, why are our poems on the transit in Dallas when we live here? So we went to Via. Uh, and Jerry Ann Jones in their community relations, who is a joy, um, said, that sounds great. That sounds great. So we have, we are now, this is the ninth year. Next year we'll celebrate 10 years of poetry on the move. Uh, we added the young Pegasus poets to the poets who we have. The first year, two years, we didn't have illustrations. And then I decided to go to the youth art programs around the city and ask them to do illuminations, illustrations for the poems. So that was Poetry on the Move. Words for Birds, which happens out at Mitchell Lake Audubon Center, is about ready to celebrate its 10th year. Um, started before I lived down that way. <laughs> No, actually not. I've lived out there for 14 years. So I knew that Mitchell Lake was a nice place and a good place for, they have an outdoor amphitheater. And so we started Words for Birds, which is an annual reading out in, in, in nature at the Audubon Center. And a couple of other pieces. Jazz poetry, as I said, on KRTU is 10 years old. Um, the first four years we did it, um, we had some money from the city, a little bit of money, but the designer of the, of the brochure was, uh, the flyer was a pro bono designer who just loved the idea. And in the third and fourth year, I was able to pay her a little because I actually hustled ads f on the do you remember the ads on the, um, I hustled ads for National Poetry Month for the calendar from places like the Twig and Wings Press and the Guadalupe. And, um, and after four years of doing that, the city, Sebastian Guajardo and the department said to me, gee, this is getting sizable. <laughs> we stopped being we stopped being under the radar, and they said we'd like to take it on. We'd like to make a commitment to producing, to gathering the information and producing the calendar. I've kind of maintained some coordinatorness of it, um, but you know the best. 
the best cultural community organizing is Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom, and they seem to have, um, and I still, I still have angst about what gets left off the, the calendar and what, does, what, what somehow doesn't seem appropriate. But um, after Lorianne Guerrero started the poetry archive at Palo Alto, College. Last year, we we added a couple years ago. We had added new book this year, which is a page on the calendar of listings of people who have had poetry books published locally. Um, last year, after the poetry archive opened, I said to Sarah Schmidt, who runs it. Um, why don't we have an event called New Book this year? And why don't you invite everyone who has a new book and they'll re all read and they'll all give you a copy of their books for the archive. It was p meant for multiple uses, um, which seemed to work and there's another year of it this year. Um, and we always lo miss somebody um, you will note, however, that on that list of new book this year, there are self-published pieces. It doesn't, this is, it doesn't matter. It's a list of what we know that people have put out this year. And, and it's important. It celebrates that piece of it. Unison in Leaf Movement is only just a single wind. Congruence in limb bending is all about the sun. Grasses, who can tell? I love the dance class of bent mesquites that rides the ridge at the meadow's edge. The hawk soars swift and deadly on that same wind, his feathers warmed by just that sun, and at his piercing cry, lots of critters skitter for cover, even our cats safe behind glass. So critters, I'm actually, though I don't, um, they're in the next collection. I just finished a, a poem um, about, uh, about wild boar, and another poem about the, the, our friendly possum who, uh, but for, we'll save those animals for next. This is, a, this is one of the coyotes that uh, wanders in. This is called Real. The real coyote dawdles past our window, an easy gate from our front fence all the way to the back and out into the high brush. Days after I tried to draw one, the real coyote saunters by with only the menace of the hungry, skinnier, rangier, just plain taller in life than my attempt to call him forth. I got it too squat, too fox-like, too Japanese print, and yet it seems I may have managed to call him forth, if only to laugh at my unsure hand, as if to say with trickster's knowing look, art imitates art, and that's life. Recycle. Re cycle. When a, white trash when a white plastic bag tattered in the wind and hooked on a fence lengthens, bends, takes on gesture, a kind of grace. When a white plastic bag becomes a cattle egret in this limitless origami that is the earth unfolding. 
it's time to rethink the horse costume and the baggy legs that cannot possibly approximate equine beauty and time to stop the car at what has festered and fumed and dried to leather all hot July long, get out of the car and look for bones to make a flute, to carve a cattle egret, to start again. Good evening, my name is Isaac Alvarez Cardenas. I'm honored to be here. Um, I was really moved by the last panel. Uh, I've got some things that I've written. I've uh, written two plays, one called 100% NDN, which stands for Naturally Designed Natives, and uh, a recent piece that I wrote for the 300th year celebration of of uh, what I call uh, Yana Juana, commonly known as San Antonio. And um, it's a period piece. I was able to have a lot of historians help me uh, with the American Indians of Texas and Spanish colonial missions and archives and able to piece. So one of the, one of the um, passages that I, that I saw was the, what they were mentioning in the panel that you know, we may not give a lot of credence to paper, uh, the papel, so to speak, but it's those papers that we can be able to go back in time and retrieve a lot of our history. Uh, we also get that from pictures. Uh, Edward S. Curtis took a lot of photographs of our people throughout the island of the turtle, commonly known as the Western Hemisphere. And George Catlin also came through this area and um, a lot of people don't know that this is the Southern Plains, that Buffalo roamed here. Uh, it's no accident there's a little town called Cibolo or Cibolo Creek also, referencing the, the buffalo that were here. And a lot of people don't realize that. But working that script that I did, I, I took something from Jolene Richard, Gabriel Taylor. If uh, it was written in 2002, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian, that should be on your bucket list to go to the mall and, and visit that museum. Uh, consultants of Native American Indians, Alaska Native and Pacific Islanders put that place together. Of course, they waited till 2002, but better late than never. But when you walk in that museum, you'll see something that says, fully Native. Who is an Indian? Native American, American Indian. First Nation or Aboriginal? Who decides? Are you full blood? Are you half blood? Quarter blood? The question of how much Indian blood you have also called blood quantum, which began with European contact. The colonization, a way of thinking continues. When we define ourselves by blood, what part of you is native? Is it your head? Is it your heart? Or maybe it's your thoughts. But it is not just your blood. We are the sum of all parts, all human, 100% fully native. So being a native is, is uh, now it's really people are wanting to know, wanting to know our history. Here in this 300 celebration, um, in the passages that I found, Wana, Wana Khan, Juan Pupaco is commonly known as the Blue Hole. And that was the original place where the water comes out and feeds the rivers. Juanacan, Juan Pupaco. And um, in, this, uh, in this history, uh, a lot of us, like they were mentioning the, the San Pedro Springs, uh, luckily we're retrieving that history. I believe that there's even markings I saw at the Central Plaza at the bus station where they actually put on purpose limestone to signify um, the San Pedro Creek and the aqueducts that they used. I believe that the Spanish came, they thought they were in Eden and they thought we were the children of Adam and Eve. 
I've experienced a lot of uh, prejudice uh, in my life. You know, I've, I have people come up, uh, especially the way I look, and say, hey, Tano, where's the Lone Ranger? But uh, in my winter of my life, being 62 years old, uh, I've, I've, I like to read one of the passages I read in, in Mark Twain that when you travel, you become tolerant. So a lot of these things about sitting Indian style or, um, you know, these ethnic slurs, they're very, they're very, very common. But the play was written as a way of letting people know that even with Indian people, we struggle with each other. Fairly recognized, non fairly recognized, state, Pueblo, community, or a group of people that call themselves American Indians. We're the only ethnicity that has to prove who we are. Um, one of the stories that I remember is about Wanakan, Wapupaco, where our people came. You just mentioned the panel was talking about, about how that, that spring would, would spew out and and we believed that there were there was creatures, the blue panther, the bear, all of these animals led us out from the underworld where we lived into this world. If you see a lot of the drawings in the Loro Pecos, uh, the people that are there, they have these long, uh, like antenna coming out of their head. In the stories in the oral tradition, that's how they breathe down there, in that third world which we call um, the Glen Rose or the, or, or, or the springs that are underneath um, the, the, um, the water that comes down. And the animals, particularly the Blue Panther, led our people out to now. Uh, it was interesting hearing the panel talking about how the Spanish wrote. So they were smart. Anytime they brought somebody, uh, particularly the first ones that came that our history records was Cabeza de Baca, uh, he had a slave, and he also an, uh, 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 an archivist, somebody that would archive and write. It's interesting that those three were the only ones that survived when their, when their ship uh, crashed in, in Florida. But he wrote. When he came through, he saw our people eating cactus. He saw how open we are and, and allowing them to come. And we're still like that. Uh, sometimes it could be our shortcoming when we're so open to strangers. Uh, but we also believe that when they, the Spanish were in contact with our people, they, were, they impacted us, but I really believe we impacted them. Because in the founding of um, San Juan Capistrano, uh, Mission Concepcion, and San Francisco de la Espada, one of the captains wrote and declared an octo, which is the second play that I wrote, Juanacan Wapupaco, literally turned over the land and the mission to our people, the Coahuitecan people, the Payayas, the Venados, the Otaque Pagame, the Come Crudos, the list goes on. And they were mentioned in writing. This writing, for us as native people who always uses the oral tradition, it was magic. For us to see an individual on one side of the room write something down, fold that paper up, send it to the other side of the room and open up and know exactly what this person wanted or wanted to say or wanted to instruct. For us, that was like probably looking at TV for the first time. So we learned, we adapted, we assimilated, we stayed quiet. We'd run away, you know, the priest would ring the bell, you know, I often think about what it's like for them to live in the open under the stars living on what the Creator gave you, and then all of a sudden being put in a four-wall cell, because there were cells that still survive at San Jose Mission, and being able to uh, hear the bell wake you up in the morning to go work in the labores, to go labor in the fields, to tend the livestock, uh, being the first cowboys, the first vaqueros. Uh, there's documentation of our people uh, when my mom's people, the Namina, the Comanche, would come and steal the horses, they would go out after them. So these are stories that we were able to translate to others, and people would write them down. And now they appear in a lot of different books, and, and I think which is a good thing. Uh, even though it's been, they're celebrating 300 years, 
And even though we've been here thousands of years, um, I think it's still good. I think it's something that uh, we want to recognize. Uh, the, the other stories that, uh, that we share amongst each other is just stories that, as a storyteller, you want to help, especially young people and the elders, by some of the stories to take on the, the attributes of kindness, of, of charity, of faith, of hope. Not particularly in any faith, but to believe in yourself, to be that center that you have to be in order to help yourself and, and the family and, and, and your community. So here in Wanakan, Wapupaco, Yanawana, it's a place where uh, we're still here. We've been able to have a voice, like we have a voice at this event. We're able to uh, bring stories that uh, can reflect, you know, the word of our people. I really believe that these stories that we write is, is for the future, for the children, uh, so they can learn that we did exist. Uh, there's a really nice little movie at San Jose Mission where this little girl comes up and says, Mommy, uh, where did the Indians go? Did they die? Did they all die? And the mother tells her, no, go look in the mirror. So many of the people that I can see here, I can see a relation, I can see a, a connection. But these, these papers are valuable. Uh, these papers do have a direction that we can learn more about the history of, of, of uh, San Antonio and bring it up. I'd like to I'd like to end with a with a quick song of uh, Wanakan Wapupaco, which is the the spirit waters that lead into the Yanawana River. Yanawan, hey Yanawan, Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, 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 Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, 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 Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco, Wanakan Wapupaco. You know, history is so important. I, I still live in an area where our ancestors came. The, the flood of 1921, my family talks about since they had horses and they had tack. When the houses came down the San Marcos River, the Alasan Creek, where the cemetery, uh, San Fernando Number 1 is, my, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and they were all, my grandfather was a young boy, they would swim out with ropes, and they would tie around the windows of these houses and buildings that were literally floating down the river, and they would beach them with the horses and the mules. Then they, would, they took these buildings apart, and in that alley called Grand Alley, used to be called Cardenas Alley, in that alley, you can see the remnants of these little bitty tiny houses that my great-grandfather had built for the whole family. Um, we still live that way, where you live here, and your father lives over there, and your grandfather lives over there, and everybody knows what's happening. We still live that way. Uh, I have a gate, and my father and mother, my dad's 90, my mom's about 86, and I go through the gate, and there they are. And um, that's the way we used to live. You know, nowadays, everyone goes away. And I wanted to raise my children in the shadows of their grandparents so they could hear the stories. And I would hear my son say, but dad, they kept, grandpa's told me that story a hundred times. And I said, yes, and you remember that story. So the next time, don't say you've already heard it. Say, no, I haven't heard it, because then you're going to hear another piece. 
and that oral tradition of your grandfather is going to live in you. How he got here, how he, how he started, how he started his life. So we've learned that. I've learned that. Um, we have our elders still. So if you have any elders in your community, go visit them. Talk with them. Ask them what was San Antonio like for them when they were young. And you're going to find some amazing, amazing things. Always remember that the oral tradition, the spoken word, a lot of times can end up in print. And that way, when it's in print, it lives forever. It never goes. It never goes away. Uh, so be careful when you press that email send <laughs> because it's not going nowhere at forever. So with that, may the great spirit be with you. May you be blessed. May the creator put sunshine in your face and the wind at your back. And in our language we say spirit tamok.